leave of this celebration of giving thanks this week, I invite you to a challenging and somewhat troubling passage of scripture that I believe is appropriate for the season in which we live and what God desires to speak into our hearts today. I want you to journey with me to the middle of your Bibles, which should be the book of Psalms. If you join in with me in the 137th Psalm, there's a word that I believe challenges us as we seek to balance our faith with the reality of the lives that we live. Psalm 137, and if you found that, we ask, if you're physically able, that you stand with us as together we reverence the reading of God's word, and I invite you to keep your Bibles open. I plan to preach from it today. Psalm 137. Hear the words of the children of Israel who find themselves in exile as a result of the Babylonian invasion. They say, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. And yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for it was there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth. They said to us, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How shall we sing the Lord's song? in a foreign land. If it's all right with you, I want to talk a little bit from the thought, when giving thanks is hard to do. You may be seated in the presence of God. When giving thanks is hard to do. After preaching last night, I went to the back of the church to meet and greet our worshipers as they dismiss themselves. As people were going out, I made it my business to wish them a happy week, a good week, to say happy Thanksgiving as they walked out the door. One lady walked by me and I said, have a happy Thanksgiving. And her reply to me was, I don't think so. Spirit of the Lord told me not to let her just leave out, so I gently grabbed her hand and pulled her to the side. So what do you mean by that? She began to describe in detail to me what was going on in her life. That very recently her brother had passed away. That her finances were not what they used to be. That one of her children, they had fallen out and he would not be coming home this Thanksgiving. And on top of all of that, she had a sickness that she'd just been diagnosed with. Talking about her sickness and her family issues and the death of her brother left her in a place where she just didn't believe that she was going to have a good Thursday. And so me being the pastor that I am, tried to encourage her and I said, well, I hope I see you on Tuesday at the pre-Thanksgiving service. Her response to me was, I don't think so. I said, why not? She said, I just don't feel like giving God thanks. And that thing sat with me all night long because it made me realize that life can sometimes put you in a place where you feel awkward and not at ease in the house of God. Because if the truth be told, you reach places in life every now and then where you really just don't feel like giving thanks. Now, I know you can't really say, man, this early in the sermon, you don't want to expose the reality of your life to your neighbor. You've got that Bible in your hand. You've got that app open to the book of Psalms, and you look mighty churchy today. <laughs> but I'd be willing to bet if I know people like I know people that there are more than a handful of us in this place who've been delivered to some situations of life where we can testify that praising God is not always easy to do. Can we talk for just a little bit? I mean, the doors are closed. Nobody's really listening but us. I come by to tell you that every now and then you can find yourself in some situations where you know 
uh, that you ought to give God thanks. It's not that you're not grateful. It's not that you don't have faith in God. It's not that you don't believe God is worthy. But life has gotten so rough and so tough. So many things have gone wrong. You find yourself dealing with issues you didn't think you'd ever have to deal with in life. And if the truth be told, when you wake up in the morning, hallelujah ain't the first thought on your mind. You know that there's nothing wrong with we're glorifying God. I believe that we ought to praise God with the fruit of our lips. I believe that everything that hath breath ought to praise the name of the Lord. I believe that I ought to bless the Lord at all times and his praise ought continually be in my mouth. But if I can be honest with you, even as a pastor, I have reached some situations in life where my circumstance has silenced my praise, where my condition has controlled my thanksgiving. And even though I know I ought to say thank you and I ought to be grateful and I ought to praise his name, there are some realities going on in my life that challenge my thanksgiving. Have you ever been there? Where you just felt awkward in church? Everybody was praising God but you. Everybody was shouting but you. You just felt like you didn't fit in and as a result the enemy begins to work on your mind and convince you that coming to church when you're down coming to church when you're stressed coming to church when you've got issues is the last thing y'all to do because you're going to be out of place if you've ever reached a place my brother and my sister where you know that praising god's hard to do giving thanks and always on your mind hallelujah and the first word out your mouth allow me to tell you you ain't the only one Children of Israel found themselves there as they pen the words to this 137th Psalm. This 137th Psalm is written by a particular and a unique group of Israelites. These are Israelites who live in exile. If you're not familiar with the history of the children of Israel, let me give you the brief synopsis. In 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire comes down on Jerusalem. They besiege the city. And one of the things they do is that they grab some of the best and the brightest of the Israelites and they ship them off to Babylon that they may be raised as Babylonian citizens. It is a process of enculturation, hopeful. That these Israelites who now live in and walk in and move around the Babylonians will abandon their Israelite ways and adopt the culture of the Babylonians. And while they are in Babylon, this unique group of Israelites in exile get word to them that Jerusalem has been destroyed and the temple now lies in ruins. And when they think about the temple that used to be in their hometown being burned to the ground, the Bible says that they went to the rivers of Babylon and there they sat. They hung their harps on the willows and began to cry. To make matters worse, the Babylonians saw these Israelites who had been deported and had seen destruction and were now wrestling with depression. And they tried to be helpful. They came to these Israelites, and this is what they said to them. Cheer up. Sing us one of them songs of Zion. Do hear what y'all did in the temple. Make a joyful noise. Rejoice. Smile. Things are going to be all right. Praise the Lord. Sing us some good old praise music. And this is the question they asked in reply. How can we sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land? H.J. Wesley translation. How can we praise God in the place that we're in? With all that we know that's going on around us and the destruction that we felt and the depression that is in our soul and the discouragement that we're wrestling with. How dare you ask us to praise God in a circumstance like this? We are in foreign lands. Come on, I tell you, life has a way of putting you in some foreign places. Places you've never been in. Never thought you'd be in. You never thought at this age of life you'd find yourself in this place. This was not how you wrote the script. 
For somebody, I got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that this Thanksgiving may be like sitting by the shores of Babylon. Because this is not how you thought your life would be in 2012 in this moment. Going to gather for Thanksgiving and some faces that used to be there won't be there any longer. Some folk that should be there have decided they won't be there. And y'all are gonna sit at the table and fake it, but you know that if, if the wrong button is pushed, all oh, holy hell <laughs> is gonna break loose. Somebody, you're sitting by the shores of Babylon because this Thanksgiving, the money isn't what it ought to be. Family isn't at peace the way they should be. Health isn't what it used to be. You find yourself in a place where if the truth be told, giving thanks is hard to do. My brothers and sisters, I come by and tell you, I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. I don't care how many tongues you're talking and how many scriptures you can quote at the drop of dime when somebody wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Everybody reaches a place where praising God is hard to do. If you've ever been there, just wink at me. I know you don't want your neighbor to think something's wrong with you, but... (laughs) We reach places where it's hard to utter hallelujah. It's hard to shout, thank you, Jesus. It's hard to wave a hand and and run around church and, and act like everything is all right in your life. Sometimes praising God and giving thanks, it's hard to do. And when you reach that foreign land and you find yourself sitting by the shores of Babylon, wondering how can I praise God in this place? I want you to remember three things that come out of this experience, the children of Israel in Psalm 137. And that is simply number one, that praising God is not on demand nor in denial. I'm going to talk today. Y'all, y'all, come on, come on, come on, come on. That praising God is neither on demand nor is it in denial. What I mean by that, these children of Israel are sitting by the shores of Babylon and some folk come by and they say to them, sing the Lord's song. They try to press the praise button. They see these people who are weeping and they come by and they tell them, stand up, lift your hands, shout amen, sing the praises of God. As if to suggest that on demand of somebody else, you ought to automatically be in a place where you render praise to God. My brothers and my sisters, I come by to tell you that authentic praise and giving glory to God is never at the demand of someone else. God, go on and preach, Pastor Wesley, that, that, that Donna, you, you can't make me praise God. You can make me shout, but that doesn't mean I'm praising God. You can make me stand up so I fit in with everybody else. But that doesn't mean I'm praising God. You can make me say amen because you said, can I get an amen? But that in and of itself does not mean that I'm truly praising God. Because praise that is authentic is never at the command or the demand of someone external to you. It always emanates from your own experience. Teach us. So you make me shout. You can't make me praise. The reason I think that bears expression in this day is because I see around the churches I have visited, and sometimes even in this one in which I worship, that every now and then we've got some Babylonians who show up and try to command praise. You, You know the praise drill sergeant. Stand up, 
Lift your hands. What's wrong with y'all? And they fuss you into a place of rendering inauthentic praise to God. I know about it because preachers do it all the time. We are uncomfortable with quiet congregations. And so we fabricate and manipulate moments of praise in order for us to feel validated in the sermons that we preach. And so we'll demand that you stand up. We'll demand that you praise. We'll demand that you say hallelujah. We'll demand that you give God glory. And sometimes in order to do that, it becomes inauthentic because you've got to deny where you really are. Can I be real with you? I don't always feel like shouting. I don't always feel like saying amen. Stop hollering at me because I'm sitting down. You've got to be careful of judging someone's walk with God by how loud they do or do not shout at shouting time in worship. Watch this, because praising God is not the only act of worship. And as pleasing as praise is to God, it's equally as meaningless if in order to praise God, you've got to deny the rough realities of where you are in life. Go on, teach Pastor Wesley. Rosette, here's what happens. These children of Israel find themselves in a place, where the Bible says, they hung their harps on the willows. The harps are the instruments that are played when you praise God. Dustin, they retired the instruments of praise and decided rather to sit down and weep. We can't shout, but we can cry. I can't dance, but I can cry. I don't feel like rejoicing, I feel like crying. And here's the problem in contemporary church, we have endorsed an era in a context of sanctified hypocrisy yeah, yeah. so that we demand you bring harps but don't create room for you just to weep yeah. not realizing that weeping is as much as an authentic expression of worship as is my shouting and my playing my harp go on preach pastor because here's the truth of the matter there are a handful of you all who came into church today and everything is right in your life. There are about two of y'all here today <laughs> that walked in with nothing other than a thank you, Jesus. Oh, but the rest of us. No matter how hard you try to hide it and how deep you conceal it, some of us came into church with some stuff on our minds. I got some problems that haven't been resolved. I got some sickness I'm worried about. I've got some issues that are circling around me. My job is in jeopardy. My children are crazy. My marriage is messed up. My money isn't what it ought to be. And if the truth be told, I'm on the brink of crying. No, yeah, but because I'm around y'all Babylonians. <laughs> I got to shout and run and holler when all I really want to do is cry. And I would suggest to you that in sincere worship, God accepts weeping as much as praising because weeping expresses a vulnerability in the presence of God 
that is an acknowledgement of God's ability to heal. I'm here, God, because I need you to heal what hurts. I need you to bind what's broken. I need you to comfort what's confused. I need you to hold what's tearing me apart. God, here I am. And I'm vulnerable that I'll do for you what you would never do in your cube for your coworker. I can't let them see me cry. Can't let them know everything that's going on. But in the house of God, I'll expose myself. All right. Um, a few months ago, I went to have my annual exam. Went to the doctor and, you know, I'm sitting there. They take my blood pressure. My blood pressure is fine, which is amazing seeing how I passed the suntan folk. Just, just amazing. <laughs> my blood pressure is all right. Oh, thank you, Halford Street, for... Amen. Not raising my blood pressure. Blood pressure's fine. Weight was all right. I'm going to the waiting room, and I'm fine. And put me in the exam room, I'm fine. And the nurse leaves. She says, take your clothes off. I don't want to take my clothes off. I'm fine. <laughs> blood pressure's fine. My weight is fine. And I don't need to take my clothes off. And so she left. She came back, opened the door, and I hadn't taken my clothes off. <laughs> She said, Mr. Wesley, I said, Reverend Wesley. <laughs> I'm not taking my clothes off. I don't take my clothes off no more. I ain't sitting in this room. I'm fine. My blood pressure's fine. My weight is fine. I feel fine. I'm not taking off my clothes. No, I'm leaving. She said, listen, the doctor won't see you until you take your clothes off. So what you mean? She said, listen, listen, if you want the doctor to really deal with you, you can't sit in here and be all clothed. If you really want the doctor to deal with you, you've got to take off everything that's hiding what's underneath you and just expose yourself for who you are. Come by to talk to somebody that feels like every Sunday you sitting here saying, I'm fine, everything's fine. And the Lord says, no, you've got to expose yourself. You've got to deal with your pain. You've got to expose the realities of your life. And it doesn't always mean you shout. Sometimes it means you cry. want a worship expression where my praising God is not on demand nor is it in denial so when you come to church and your neighbor don't stand up leave them alone they ain't shouting don't judge them because you never know who really just wants to weep praising God is not on demand nor is it in denial the second thing I want to tell you whenever it's hard to give thanks and you're in a place where you feel you just don't want to say hallelujah. Know this, that praising God is not about your place. It's about his presence. Y'all stay with me, that my sincere praise is not controlled by the place I find myself in life, but it's rather an acknowledgement to the presence of God in my life. Watch this. Here's the problem the children of Israel in Psalm 137. In Psalm 137, they said, listen, here we are in Babylon, and we're remembering Zion. Notice they don't say Jerusalem, because in the cultic life of Israel, Zion is a specific reference to the house and the home and the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's, in essence, what they say in Psalm 137. We are here, but we remember that God is is back there and in their mind we cannot praise God where we are because God is not where we are God is where we left him in the temple and so they began to doubt the presence of God in Babylon because they had limited the presence of God to Jerusalem and now that Jerusalem had been destroyed and the temple was no longer they had mistakenly convinced themselves that God was still over there and there's no way that God is over here with us. And so here's the issue that God had always had with Israel. God was not originally in favor of the children of Israel building a temple. When David wanted to build the temple, God objected for one critical reason. God objected to the temple because God preferred the tabernacle. Go on, preach, but can I get deep this morning? He said, I don't want the temple, I want the tabernacle. The word tabernacle.
tabernacle literally means to move alongside with. And God says the reason I'm objecting to the temple is that the temple is stationary. And I know you, if you build a temple, you will think that the only place I dwell is in the temple. And you forget that I am a tabernacling God. That when you were in the wilderness, I tabernacled with you. When your enemies were around you, I tabernacled with you. When you didn't know where you were going to go, I tabernacled with you. When you woke up in hell, I tabernacled with you. When you weren't on the mountain, I tabernacled with you. So it says to the children of Israel, here's your problem. You're looking at where you are and your place, and you forgot that I am a tabernacling God. That wherever you go, I will go with you. Baby, you can't get rid of me. You can't run from me. You can't hide from me. You can't limit me. Wherever you go, God says, I am with you. So here's the problem. He says it's easy to praise God when you're in a place that has all the signs that God is with you. It's easy to praise God when nothing's going wrong. It's easy to praise God when your bills are paid. It's easy to praise God when everybody likes you. Can I tell you something? That don't impress me. Anybody can shout with two cars in the garage. Here's what the Lord says, that, that your praise should not be predicated on your place. If all hell is breaking loose, if you're broke and down to your last dime, if you don't have everything you think you ought to have, you still have a reason to praise because your praise is not based on your place. It's an acknowledgement of my presence. Come, 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 come here. That's why you ought to give thanks and praise God no matter what your circumstance because your praise is really not based upon what you drive, where you live, and how good things are in your life. Your praise is acknowledging that God tabernacled with me. I didn't plan on winding up here. I didn't desire to be in this place. This is not the script that I wrote for my life, but this much I acknowledge that whether I wake up in heaven or in hell, that God is still with me if I'm on the mountain or in the valley God is right there by my side uh, how do I know he's with me because I'm still breathing and I'm still moving and I'm still making it and if it had not been for God on my side I know I would have lost it all I know I beat is is there anybody here that in spite of how bad things are you know that you know that you know that you know that you know that, you know that, you know that if it had not been for the Lord. Would you do me a favor and somebody tell them I know God is with me. God has to be with me. As to watch this, this is deep. This is deep. Don't you miss this? That my praise is literally an acknowledgement of his presence. That I don't praise God because I like everything I'm going through. I don't praise God just when he answers my prayer the way I want when I told him to. I praise him so I can acknowledge that he's in my life. Okay, uh, let me help y'all. I want you to watch worship every now and then. And watch that every now and then you're going to find... Usually it's a deacon or an usher. It's going to bring me a note in the pulpit. I want you to watch this. I want you to watch, watch, watch. But Barry, every now and then, deacons, they ain't usually trustee, deacons, deacons. <laughs> bring me notes in the pulpit. Now I need to let you know, I don't like notes. In the pulpit. Now before you, before you get me wrong, let me finish the story. I don't like notes in the pulpit because I'm focused on trying to preach. Right. And usually a note means something's wrong. Yeah. I don't want to know what's wrong. 
Just want to preach. They bring me notes. Nine out of ten of those notes are not problems. They send me notes to let me know that somebody has come to church that I ought to acknowledge. I don't like notes. I'd rather do something else. But my deacons love me enough to know. They say, Reverend, somebody's in the midst that you can't ignore. Somebody has showed up who you better acknowledge. They were elected officials. And we can't just let them sit and not be acknowledged. So here's a note to remind you that they are so worthy that you ought to acknowledge them even when you don't feel like it. Can I give you a note? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God and he's in your life. That's why I praise God when I don't feel like it. That's why I acknowledge him when it doesn't make me happy. Because I want the world to know that God is in my life. Yeah. Tell somebody, tell them, acknowledge he's here. Yeah. I, got, I got to go. Y'all are ready to go to Sunday school. Here it is. Praise is not on demand, nor is it in denial. And praise is not based on my place. It's based on his presence. And watch this finally. Praise should always be in memory of his mercy. I understand these Israelites that in the place they were in, they didn't feel like they had a reason to praise God. We can't sing in the place that we're in. And that's what makes this psalm so unique and strange out of the other 150. Because when you typically think of the Psalms, you think of these encouragements to bless the Lord. The Psalms are considered the praise book of Israel. The Psalms are, are the hymnal that Israel would use when they began to worship God. And if you understand the book of Psalms to be like the hymnal, then you need to understand that there was a time when the Jewish rabbis and religious leaders sat down and they did two things. Number one, they made a decision about which songs made it in the hymn book. There were more than just 150. They sat down and decided that the hymn book of Israel would include these 150. That makes me wonder why they allowed the 137th Psalm to get in. If I had been on the committee, Psalm 137 might not have made it. Who's going to put a hymn in the hymn book that says, don't sing? Okay, 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 okay. Why would you include a psalm that says we can't praise right now? They chose it because they knew that at some moment, every child of God would feel like 137. But that's why they also did another thing, and I want you to catch this deep, this in kindergarten. Not only did they choose the hymns, but they put them in an order that made sense. The Psalms were not randomly put together. They were placed strategically to send 
a theological message. So, Psalm 137 is not the first psalm. Because they figured this ain't the way to start worship. They put it in the latter half, knowing that at some point on your journey from 1 to 150, you are going to wind up in a 137, where giving thanks would be hard to do. So here's the good news, and I'm done. Ty, they said that although you're going to get at a 137, we're going to preface 137 with 136. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't miss the structure. This is deep. Before you get to 137, you got to come through 136. I know that's deep. That's deep. 137 is preceded by I double dare you to read 136 as a reminder that when you get in 137 and you feel like you don't have a reason to give thanks just look right behind you and read what the psalmist said oh give thanks unto the lord for he is good and his mercy endureth forever verse number two his mercy endures forever verse number three his mercy endures forever verse number four his mercy endures forever verse number five his mercy y'all ain't getting it yet endures forever so here's what they said that even when you feel like you don't have a reason to give thanks you've got a reason to give thanks when you're not where you want to be you got a reason to give thanks when life is rough on you, you've got a reason to give thanks. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. Okay, okay, okay. I, 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 I'm done, I'm done. Y all, y all, I, I didn't come here to make y'all shout. That'd be contrary to the essence of the sermon. But there's an old hymn it goes with something like this. I know some of y'all are too new school. You weren't raised with this. But it says like this, that when affliction threatens to swell over your soul and the sunlight is hard from you, if you're tempted to fret or complain, just think of his goodness to you. And when you think of his goodness, and you think of his mercy and you remember what the Lord brought you through and you recall how the Lord forgave you and forgave you and forgave you and forgave you and forgave you, and forgave you. you've got a reason to give God thanks so here's what the writers of the psalm said that when giving thanks is hard to do, think about what God has already done. Think about how he gave you another chance. Think about the sins that were washed away. And know that even if you don't have money, you got a reason to give thanks. If you sit at that table all by yourself, you have a reason to give thanks. Because his mercy endures forever. Praise is not on demand, nor is it in denial. It's not about your place. It's about God's presence. And it's rooted in your memory of the mercy of God. 
For God has been good. And his mercies endure forever. Somebody, that, that, that's your call to Thanksgiving this week. To think about the mercies of God. Before you even got saved, before you gave your life to Christ, before you joined anybody's church, God was being merciful to you. You didn't reap everything you sowed. You didn't deal with all the consequences of your choice. The Lord's been merciful. Yes, he has. 